So for the whole month of June, and bringing us right into this first uh, week in July, because we had Father's Day uh, that got in the uh, talks, we have been speaking about our zone of genius. We've been talking about leaping into that zone of genius. And that is where there is a fuller expression of our own divine power and magnificence a greater experience of connectivity, of aliveness, of happiness, of love, of creativity, of abundance, and a life that is simply easier. It's good. In other words, we have leaped into our zone of genius, which is really our God zone. It's our God zone, and this is what we have been focusing on the whole month of June, and it's based on this book by Gay Hendricks, The Big Leap, which is Conquer Your Hidden Fears and Take Life to the Next Level. I knew by the fourth time I would get the whole entire title. <laughs> so this is where we are expressing our genius, and that is expressing our good. Expressing the good is where we are productive, where we are happy, and where we are living our lives on purpose, on purpose. Where we are a blessing to the world. We can be a blessing to the world, but first we have to be that blessing to ourselves. So this series of talks has been, has been very impactful for me, because I, I really love it um, when I get inspired too. So I'm, I'm writing these things and I'm, I'm, I've been watching all day what I say, you'll see why later on, because these talks are really powerful and they're to be used. They're practical and they're applicable for all of us. So I'm curious to know how many people have heard all four of the talks for this month? Just raise your hand. Oh, good, yay, that's great. Because if, you, if you're not here, we do have it on YouTube, for those who don't know. And um, I'm also wondering, <coughs> If anyone, if a few of you have taken a bit of a leap or a big leap um, or in the process of it, and maybe you can share a brief idea of what that looks like. Has anyone here had any kind of breakthrough in the big leap? It would take all morning. <laughs> <laughs> Stand, up. Stand up and say it. Um, Small room. Okay. So um, I, I took my kid to counseling and uh, uh, I've been wanting to see his soft side uh, he's he's like a brick by brick man you can't get to him until you take down the bricks and uh, after the session he went home and said he was going to go visit his girlfriend in Paris and I just felt like that was like a big leap, mm -hmm. and that like really reinforces what I want from him like I want him to be a full person, and I want him to have emotion and feeling, <coughs> and so I'm proud. Thank you, Brett. Anyone else? <laughs> Anyone else have a, little, a little leap. Okay. Well, thank you, Fred, for mm -hmm. sharing that. Because once you have broken free of that upper limit problem that we've been talking about, that inner thermostat, or are aware of it and are working on it, you've committed, just, just by the recognition, you've already committed to living in your zone of genius. And you have begun to get clarity on what you, that zone is for you. Because we have to understand these things to actually apply them. And your job is to learn to live in this zone all of the time. To constantly program our thoughts and to remind ourselves to live in our God zone, our zone of genius. So <laughs> Hendricks describes this as a delicate tight, walk, tight rope walk, which eventually gets easier as you master the skills that are required to keep your balance, he writes, in your new environment. Fortunately, he does not leave us hanging, and he does offer us some shortcuts. Uh, learn by trial and error of how to get into our zone of genius. Mm -hmm. And so, do you know the power of trial and error? Of course not. Of course not, okay. So, here's a quick synopsis of it then. One time an interviewer, 
as a successful businessman, what he attributed his success to. And the businessman said two words, right decision. And the interviewer said, how do you make right decisions? And the businessman answered, experience. And so the interviewer asked him, how do you get experience? And the successful businessman replied, wrong decision. So, you see, all of us get experience in life by what we do and what we classify as right and wrong. So we learn from what we feel is not working for us. So we might clarify, we might uh, term, it, term it as wrong decision, but it's a way of learning. To me, a mistake or a wrong decision is a way of getting experience of what I don't want and knowing what it is I do want. So this morning we will learn from those who have already gotten experience. And our three shortcuts to living in this zone of genius, your God zone, are using the ultimate success mantra, which we're going to learn in a little bit, unleashing the power of your enlightened no, that's a good one, and living in Einstein time. <laughs> So we're going to do those three. Using the, su the success mantra. So as students of science of mind, we all know the power of our thoughts and our words. We all know that what we have in consciousness manifests in our lives. And we also know that this is the way that life works. Our thoughts are creative. Our thoughts, our emotions are creative. We create. So we are very powerful beings. So let's use the way that life works to help us live our life in that zone of genius we've been talking about for the month of June. And Hendrix writes this. He says, the ultimate success mantra is a comprehensive intention you used to set to yourself in your zone of genius. It is a set of instructions for your conscious and your subconscious mind to chew on, designed to inform all of your actions and decisions. If you use the ultimate success mantra as instructed, your life will gradually conform to the comprehensive intention contained within it. I want you to mount, he writes this, I want you to mount a gentle, but unstoppable offense against old conditioning. Mm -hmm. And the universal success mantra is the best way that I've found how to do that. So you're probably thinking enough already. What is it? <laughs> what is the ultimate success mantra? So we're going we're gonna to repeat it a, a couple times, and we're going to bring it back in the end, too. So. This is the mantra, and we all know a mantra is something that we repeat over and over. It helps to, affirmations are good for that. It's like an affirmation. So we help to reprogram our thinking so that we can infuse those new thoughts into our subconscious as we are releasing the old ones. So this is the success mantra, the ultimate one, according to Hendricks. I expand in abundance, success, and love every day as I inspire those around me to do the same. I expand in abundance, in success, and in love every day as I inspire those around me to do the same. How simple is that? Yet how profound, how profound. So this mantra counters directly the oak in your life. Remember the oak? What is it? <laughs> Upper level problems, right. We've been talking about the oak for the month of June. So that's our upper level problem. It's the, there's a place like, uh, Hendrix uses it, if you haven't been here, as a, an inner thermostat where we can enjoy just so much success, just so much love, just so much fulfillment, and then boom, mm -hmm. we hit what feels like the level, and we self-sabotage. It's mm -hmm. an inner thermostat that's been programmed when we were probably very young. 
and it keeps us from experiencing a fuller, fuller, more productive life. Because then we second guess ourselves, we sabotage ourselves. So that's that's what the OP is. It's that upper limit problem that we have talked about dismantling, disparaging, taking it down. We last week we walked across the bridge to our zone of genius, so today we're gonna live in it. And so here are two ways that we can use this. The two ways that we can use this. The first is meditation, which we're gonna do it a little bit later. We're gonna take this mantra into meditation. In your daily life. So this is the kind of thing that you can write down on a piece of paper and carry with you. You can put it up everywhere you go to remind yourself, to reprogram that old way of thinking and know that you are a successful, fulfilled, loving being and that you're always expanding in it. We know what we focus on grows. So the more we focus on this expansive nature, the successful nature that we all have within us, the more that grows. Okay. The second shortcut to living in your zone of genius is the enlightened no. Did you love that? The enlightened no. And it's a very simple concept, it really is. But it's not so simple to implement. So you produce an enlightened no when you turn down something that doesn't fit into your zone of genius. Mm -hmm. It's called an enlightened no because you're saying no in service of the bigger yes. The bigger yes that's calling you. Yes. It's always a bigger yes. That bigger yes is your genius zone. That's your genius zone. You're saying no because you've chosen now to focus on activities that are clearly in that zone. The zone that your divine self resides in. You're divine. Do you all know that? You're all divine. Each and every one is a divine being of God. Each and every one. How glorious is that? So we have this zone of genius. It's our God zone. That great zone. So we could all benefit from taking a careful look at the number of things that we do say yes to. Things that sometimes don't clearly fit into that zone, even if they might seem beneficial <coughs> for other reasons. These requests can eat up a great deal of our energy. And we keep saying yes to things that, well, oh, maybe, maybe not. It's, it, it doesn't, you know, always going by how we feel. Does it feel right? Does it feel right? If it feels right, then that's the kind of, that's, that's moving into your God zone. And those are the things you want to say yes to. If it feels kind of, uh, maybe, maybe you need an enlightened no, so that you have room left to say yes to all those glorious things that are forever presenting themselves to you. If you but become conscious of them, they're there, always. And they help express that genius of who you are. Each time you say an enlightened no to something that does not serve your genius, you build a stronger foundation for yourself in your zone, in that great zone. So my, my experience um, for myself with, with just leaving a former spiritual center that I was with for, for many 18 years. And that was really hard to say, no, this is not serving what is calling me out to the greater yes. And so then, at some point, I, I listened to that intuitive self that was pulling me into this greater thing, and it was called Joyful Gathering Spiritual Center, <laughs> almost immediately. Definitely. Wasn't it? Carol was there the whole way, the whole way with me, holding my hand. <laughs> but there was room then. I had to have an enlightened no in order to say a yes to the, the thing that was pulling me into my God zone, as Reverend Retta has, is doing right now with her spiritual center in Philadelphia. Yes, pulling us into these, these zones of our genius, where our gifts and our talents, our success, our fulfillment, all lie. The love of God, 
lies right there in that place. So now we're going to move into, well, I think this is the challenging part. I think the other two were the not. Living in Einstein time. Mm -hmm. So finally, for your life to work harmoniously, you need to develop a harmonious relationship with time. Mm -hmm. Creating time for the fuller expression of genius. So the old paradigm, which was new, the Newtonian time, for those of you who know all these, these um, quantum physics things, say that there is only a finite amount of time, and it must be carefully proportioned out, or else there will not be enough to do all the things that we need to do. This paradigm is looking outside of ourselves at time. We're looking at time as something separate from us. And, and usually what happens is we assume there's a scarcity of time, which leads us to an uncomfortable feeling of urgency. I mean, we'll never get that. But sometimes some people have too much time. And when they have too much time, then they're in a state of boredom and frustration. So <clears throat> if you've ever thought that way at any time, that the time is out there, join the club, because I'm totally a part of that club. And there is hope, though, however, and it's, it's, this is the part for all of us to really join in together and really embrace. I'm doing it. because. While the no Newtonian view is where most of us start, because we've, we've been trained that way, it's not how time actually works. Yeah. Newtonian time scarcity is just a stage we're passing through, just as Newtonian physics was a stage that we passed through on our way to Einstein's breakthrough. And Einstein's simplified breakthrough is the theory of relativity. I'm not going to get into that whole thing. No, don't, don't worry. I don't even know it all, so I wouldn't even try. I'd have a scientist up here. An hour, you ever feel this? An hour participating, this is like Einstein time, and something you actually love to really do it feels like a minute. It feels like a minute. But then when you're participating in something that is really difficult, or if you're like sitting on a hot stove, if you it feels like an hour. I mean, if you're there for a minute, it feels like an hour. You know, something painful, something you don't want to do. It feels like a minute. So while, which is, what this is all saying is that passage of time is not what is really relevant. It is how we perceive time. How we perceive time. And if we realize who we are, as an expression of the source of all that is, we're part of the great I am, that is the truth of our nature, that is who we are, then we know that time is an effect. Time is not of the divine. The divine doesn't have a wristwatch. I mean, it doesn't have a wrist, so. But it doesn't have a wristwatch. <laughs> There's no time in the divine, right? And so it's an effect. It's an effect. So the shift then is to shift into the Einstein time, and it takes a moment. It takes you the moment you embrace one simple truth. You are where time comes from. You are where time comes from. Time comes from within you. And if you've ever really noticed um, something like driving, you could be driving from one place to another, and all of a sudden you're there. I know everyone's had this experience, and you're like, yep. oh my god, how did I get here? <laughs> I don't remember. And you're there in record time. Yep. That's Einstein time. That's the theory of relativity. That's Einstein time. That's Einstein time. And then you see these people that are really, 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 really busy. I know a couple here, one in the back back there. Um, have like so many things to do in their lives and you go how in heaven's name do they fit all of that in one day mm -hmm. they are functioning on Einstein time mm -hmm. they are fun 
so relative. It's all relative to our perception of it. So I want you to repeat after me. I am where time comes from. I am where time comes from. I have the power. I have the power to make as much time as I want. To make, to make as much time as I want. want. And that's the truth. Have you ever thought you were running really, really late for something, and then when you show up to the thing, you're like the first one? That happens to me all the time. <laughs> all the time, because I got this thing of being late. So I'm, I'm always working with this time thing. I'm going to be working with this for a while. So you need to really call me on it, and I know you will. Uh, when you say, oh my god, I don't have time for that. Just call me on it. Mm -hmm. But y you think you're going to be late for something, if you're like me. And so you're really rushing and you're getting ready and you're really running late and the time on the on the, the clock back there says something and you're the first one there. I mean, even when I show up late for parties, I'm like usually the first one there. It's like really <laughs> insane. <laughs> the last one to leave usually. <laughs> so Greg, Greg Braden, I know a lot of you have heard of him, in the Isaiah Effect writes about this. He writes in Time and Group Will. And he tells this story uh, about arriving on a bus um, from this trip from Mount Sinai to Cairo, Egypt, that should have taken several hours, but actually took a little bit more than half of that amount of time. And this is what he writes. Through the distance between Mount Sinai and Cairo, even though it had not changed, our experience of time while we traveled the distance had. It was recorded on the wristwatches of every military man, armed guard, and passenger on that bus. It was as if our memories of that day, in the presence of one another, had somehow been squeezed into an experience, a fraction of the time expected. Where, the rest, where was the rest of our time? Clearly, we were not aware of the phenomenon when it was occurring. The questions are, how did it happen and why? Perhaps herein we find the clue. In our innocence of anticipating the experiences within the pyramids and speaking of the experiences as if we were already inside these ancient chambers, our awareness had shifted from how long the trip was taking to what it felt like to be there. And sometimes we, we kind of get that if we're going on, on a trip that we're really excited about and we're in the car and we're driving there and it, and it feels like we're there in about a half hour because we're with our friends or you know, people we really like to be with, especially that helps. <laughs> and we're having a great time and we're really looking forward to the trip and to the day and you're there already. So quit thinking about time as out there, as out there in effect the thing. Take ownership of time. Isn't that a different concept? Taking ownership of time. Acknowledging that you are where time comes from, within you. And it will, it will stop owning you. Because our time, sometimes it feels like it's owning me. It feels like it's owning me. And so the first way to do this, Hendrix writes about, is going on a complaint diet, which we've heard of those. Complaint, I can't even wear it, one of those yellow bands, because the minute I put it on, I start complaining about how much I don't like yellow bands. <laughs> <laughs> but this, is, this one here is a complaint diet about time. This is about time. So notice, this is how we can know. We're noticing it, but I've been noticing all morning, already, all morning. Notice in your conversations how often you say things like, I wish I had time to stop and chat. But I'm in a hurry. Where did the time go? There simply aren't enough hours in a day. If only I got in another hour of sleep. <laughs> Those who know me know I have a thing with sleep. <clears throat> Love to talk to you, but I gotta run. I have to get to the bank. I don't have enough time to do that. So if any of those statements resonate with you, then you know that you are, the time then is controlling your life, is controlling your emotions. And the thing, the thing with time is it makes a victim out of every one of us because we never seem to get it all done. 
because there's not enough time. And if we believe there's not enough time, guess what? There's not enough time, right. <laughs> And so we treat it like a scarce commodity. If we bring ourselves into the now, that's why living in that now moment is really important. Just bring it up. When sometimes if I go, especially on a Monday when I think the whole week, that's why I don't go to the whole week. I gotta bring myself back to right here, right now. What can I get done in this moment that I'm fully present in? I'm owning my time. When I do that, I'm owning my time. So that's that's kind of like what I do to keep myself in the now moment and not going into this, not enough time to do all of this. There's no way that I'm going to get all of it. It always gets done. It always gets done. Does it not? And the important stuff gets done. So for us to know that moving into our zone of genius, this is all going to tie in, <laughs> to know that time is an effect. Time is something that is out there. It's, it, we think it is but really and truly is our perception of what time is within us, within us. And Hendricks says that each statement is a mini whimper of misery. A mini whimper of misery, <laughs> of that. <laughs> and that's the claim that he writes, a claim that time is the whip master and we are the hapless galley slaves Growing desperately to stay ahead mm -hmm. of the lash. Oh, I gotta get this done now, so I'm gonna get done. Get this done. The moment you stop complaining about time and start realizing you are the producer of time, mm -hmm. hmm. you are the your zone of genius has a greater area in which to roam, in which to be expressed. So you're closing it down when you're so consumed with the complaining of not having enough time to get this done. You ever really see successful people or be, been in their presence? They do so much. And I never hear them complain about time. I never hear them complain about time. Get everything done. They control their own destinies. So I want to end our time together today and our time spent on taking this big leap which we've been talking about, by returning to the ultimate success mantra that Hendricks said to use in two ways. So the first way is in meditation, which we're going to do a brief, <coughs> a brief uh, meditation to just anchor that into your consciousness a little bit. And the, the second one is to use it in your daily lives. Use it. Put it up wherever you can see it. Put it on a little card and carry it with you just to remind yourself, just to remind yourself. So, I'd like you to take a moment, if you feel comfortable, and close your eyes. And this is not really long. <clears throat> so, the ultimate success mantra is, I expand in abundance, success, and love every day as I inspire those around me. I expand in abundance, success, and love every day as I inspire those around me to do the same. And you might have thought up, something opposing that, just notice it. I expand in abundance, success, and love every day as I inspire those around me do the same. Breathe that in. Feel your lungs, your mind expand. I expand in abundance success and love every day 
as I inspire those around me to do the same. And I have a quote from Ernest Holmes. If there is an infinite creative intelligence which makes things out of itself by itself becoming the thing that it makes, then the creative genius of this universal mind is also the creative genius of its individualization, which is what I am. So I invite each and every one of us to remember that we are an individualization of this supreme intelligence, this infinite source of, of good, love, peace, joy, limitless possibilities, infinite potentiality. This is the truth of each and every one. Each and every one is a genius by right of birth. Being born into this human form, the thing that's being born is genius self. It is that divine, eternal self that cannot die, that goes on forever, that is forever supporting, loving, guiding each and every one. And so we move into this space place of opening up to the infinite guidance, the infinite wisdom, and embracing our gifts, our talents, our genius. For I know fully that each one is a complete genius and resides in this zone, this zone, this God zone, this God zone of good right here, right now. And in that knowing, in that absolute expansive, successful, loving atmosphere, I am assured that each and every one is moving is jumping, is leaping into their zone of genius. And so it is. And so it is. <laughs>